Welcome everyone to the first session of our lecture series, Historic House Museums Respond to Crisis. I am Sheridan Small, the Director of Education at Dumbarton House. Dumbarton House is a historic house museum located in Washington, D.C., and we're the headquarters of the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. We interpret life in the capital city in the early 1800s through the life of Joseph Nurse, the first register of the treasury and the other individuals who lived and worked at Dumbarton House while he was there, both free and enslaved. This is the first lecture in a six part series funded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I encourage you all to sign up for the other sessions if you have not already, as we will be exploring new topics and institutions each week as we learn how historic house museums have been responding in the past year or so to the urgent needs created by climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, and social justice movements. Each session will be recorded and available to watch on our YouTube page afterwards. There are over 15,000 historic house museums in the United States, all of which have felt at some time the pressure to change their structure, their programs, or their services in response to the needs of their unique communities. This program will present case studies of some historic house museums who are doing just that and are responding to current events and crises in ways that ensure their survival as well as support their communities. Over the next few weeks, these six sessions will demonstrate that historic house museums are often uniquely positioned because of their location, history, and or resources to lead the way in important community conversations and movements. That includes managing environmental and climate impacts and helping the community become sustainable and resilient. Our speaker for today, Sarah Sutton, will talk about some of the unexpected and expected ways that his house museums can help the public and museum professionals address climate change. Sarah is principal of Sustainable Museums and works with cultural organizations addressing environmental issues and climate change. She is cultural sector lead for America is All In, the largest coalition of civil society supporters of the Paris Agreement in the world. She teaches in the Harvard University Extension School Museum Studies Program and is on the Climate Task Force for the American Psychological Association. She is co-author of Environmental Sustainability at Historic Sites and Museums. She lives in Tacoma, Washington, where she kayaks, grows vegetables, keeps chickens, sometimes eats red meat, and regularly goes over the five-minute shower dial. Without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Sheridan. Glad to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm coming to you from Tacoma, Washington. You can see the expression of public pride in the background. This is also the traditional lands of the Puyallup Puyala people who are still here in a vibrant part of the whole community. I'm glad that you've all joined us today. I'm going to share my screen and give you sort of a fire hose version of what our options are today. I'm gonna to apologize in advance for dumping too much information on you at once, but that's because there's so much good work going on. If anybody wants any of this information afterwards in a different format, you can reach out to Sheridan or to me and I'll be happy to share it with you. So, uh, and please do, if you have any questions, send them to Sheridan in the chat while we're doing this. Um, she'll interrupt me and ask if I've used a, a term that you're not interest, uh, not understanding or if I've glossed over something you'd like to hear more about. So you'll notice the Dumbarton House is on the cover of the book about environmental sustainability at historic sites and museums. And that's because the staff has been doing this good work for a good long time, since before it was public discussion, since before it was common, and they did it because it made sense. It worked well for their institution, it made sense to the staff, and it was good for the community as well. There we go. So we're better to do this work as charitable, educational, and community-focused institutions. Historic houses and museums have a responsibility and an opportunity to use their resources for public benefit. We are trusted resources. We're familiar, we're usually easy to find, often a place that people feel comfortable going to. 
We present in varied settings and in varied ways, and we provide skills to help communities understand and deal with what's going on around them, close by, in the country, and in the world. So how can we use that for responding to crises? Well, since I'm kicking this off, and because climate change is related to physical health, mental health, economic health, and equity, all of these crises wrap up together. So I'm gonna start my presentation by starting from looking at all four of them. Then I'll focus on what we can do at our particular sites and what we're going to have to start doing. And then I'll go back out to the big picture of how you can make a difference. So there are two charts here. I'm just gonna prep you for them. Here's the first one. Second one looks a lot like it, but what the focus is on is this word here that says the crisis experience and the crisis response. You'll see these two charts have a lot in common and you'll see that the crises that we're looking at have a lot in common. So we're looking at currently four horsemen of the apocalypse, climate, COVID health crisis, COVID economic crisis, and an equity issue. And at the beginning of this event, all of we folks who are climate nerds stopped talking about climate change during COVID because of the, the death and the loss and the crisis all around us made us feel as if talking about climate, a big picker issue, a faraway issue, seemed tone deaf. And so we just sort of went quiet for a while. But we started to hear that all of the things that people were experiencing, everything in that left-hand column, all sounded familiar. And that's because health issues are connected to climate. Health economic issues are connected to climate issues and the same for equity issues. Everything is interconnected. You can influence one with the other positively if you do so intentionally. And at that point, we realized we couldn't be quiet about climate because it's all interconnected we have to have the conversation to solve all of the problems together. We have to try and solve them all at once and be attentive to how focusing on one issue influences the others. And the best way we can do that is by aligning. Them. But looking at all of them to find the commonalities is important. So in the crisis experience, it's worth understanding that the near-term threats are different for different populations and different geographies. That's why it's un all of these things are unevenly distributed depending upon who you are, where you're from, what your personal experience is. Understanding that unevenness is important for addressing the solution. But all of them require collective action. All of them require individual sac sacrifice or behavior change. The benefits for solving them though are unevenly dis distributed which is why we're having trouble getting on the same page with solutions. They're all politically charged and they all involve power plays or gaslighting where we're putting the blame on someone who is not the cause. So if we look at resolving those, responding to those community challenges, all of these responses apply to all four of the issues. And we must keep them all in mind in order to multi-solve, solve multiple problems at once. Science and data transparency matter. The solutions require innovation and creativity. History has solutions and evidence of previous experiences. Media is used intentionally for influence, for good, and for disinformation. Positive community engagement, positive community engagement matters in creating effective lasting solutions. And the language and the communication paths we use in doing that work also matters. Cultural institutions and particularly historic houses are right at that point of community conversation where we can engage all of these response approaches in the work that we do. Now, not everyone will do all of those things, but we all can do some of them and being aware of how they interact is what your job is. So let's look at the COVID crisis and how it affected us. Well, there's history, right? I said history has examples and a history has an example right at Dumbarton House, where in 1942-45 Dumbarton House closed as a historic house museum in order to be a space for the Red Cross 
to address the issue, to serve the community. And they did that again. They did that again by trying to be a COVID testing place and uh, um, a food aid distribution place, which didn't work out in their community at that time. There were other sites that were available, so no barn house wasn't needed for that. But they still had a role to play, and they worked together with the area historic houses and professionals in order to collect personal protective equipment and share it with Unity Healthcare. That happened across the museum sector, but it happened organically. We didn't say, hey, as a sector, we should do this. Individual sites realized they should do it. And when they were really on their game, like Dumbarton House was, they coordinated the effort so it had greater impact. Now in a place like the Pacific Northwest, we have a lot of island spaces and Vashon Island is just a ferry ride from me, but it's a $30 ferry ride. The alternative to get to a COVID testing site is to travel across a bridge to go to Seattle, which was the hot spot for COVID-19 getting started in the United States. No one wanted to leave the island. So Mukai Farm and Garden and Vashon Island had a circular loop for the drive-in entry for people to come through and get tested on site. Brilliant, critical move. Simple to do, valuable to the community. Oops, I've spelled King Manor wrong and Kelsey Brow is even in the building. So sorry for that. This says King Manor, New York, providing community service during um, COVID-19 pandemic, having an outdoor fair where they gave away seeds and plants and critically in response to community need, they provided women's sanitary supplies, so often overlooked in providing supplies for the community on what they might need. So they pr provided sanitary supplies, general to toiletries, and then in that mix, they created opportunities for completing the census in a safe and supported way, and in a safe and supported way, registering for the vote. Here are a few more examples of COVID responses from places that were historic houses. So converting your landscapes into food production, creating your bakeries um, and, um, and cafes into food production and food service places were really, really important for so many. Dumbarton House making sure that people knew that this open space and in the garden behind that people could come and be outside safely in this urban setting and get fresh air and respite and even have free Wi-Fi if they were working from home. But what about after the climate, the climate crisis in the period after COVID-19? What is it that our institutions can do? Well, we can continue, that is sustainability work, the basic stuff of not making everything worse, or we can expand our efforts in what we call climate action, action towards an improved climate, something that is more outward focused, more community engagement, and it reaches farther beyond the work that we do on site. Both are important, but they're different approaches to solving the problem. So we're going to look at some of the sustainability things, and then we'll look at um, climate action. But everyone, everyone can talk about sustainability and climate at their historic site. And if you're not aware of the National Park Service super cultural resources climate change strategy, which was put out in 2017, then you're missing a really good story. And inside that, the best story of all is Marcy Rockman's um, Every Place Has a Climate Change Story, a critical approach to doing interpretation at your place. Marcy Rockman is a gift to the field and ought to get the Nobel Prize of History someday when they invent it. So you can find that. Um, online National Park Service Cultural Resources Climate Change Strategy. So what do we do at our sites? We can document change, climate change, and the causes of it. We can communicate climate change, how it's affecting the historic house or your community. We can normalize responsible discussions about climate change. It's not something that we should shy away with. It's perfectly appropriate at our site. We can reduce our own environmental impacts. Those impacts might hopefully mitigate climate change in the future. We can plan to adapt for change and help our communities adapt to that change. 
and we can create resilient institutions and communities that can tackle the next crises when they come, which will probably be sooner than we all like. So we're going to fly through a bunch of these, not, but I'm not going to do all of them. At your site, you can look at, talk about how physical orientation was set up historically in order to use the affordances of heat, sunlight, fresh air, or shelter in that location, depending upon your environment. How we operate the, our buildings in order to manage um, warmth, cool air, fresh air. Thinking about the passive heating and cooling approaches, how we light without turning on a switch. We can think about historical practices of drying your clothes without a, without a um, electric dryer, but drying them on bushes while on the Oregon Trail. So they're not driving on that particular day, they've stopped to do laundry, they're drying the clothes on bushes or draping wherever they can. Um, journals mentioning how women conserved water by using water that they wash dishes with or clothes with in order to water the garden. And examples of managing food, um, putting it by, putting it um, up so that we have it during other seasons. And then how we use our grounds. This is a weakness, I think, in our sector. We don't use our grounds to an advantage to reduce the impacts of climate change on our sites or to tell the story of how we use the landscape around us in order to mitigate things. So I'll give you a few examples of how our structures, just as they are, help us think about energy, comfort, airflow, and light. So dormers on a building are an opportunity to talk about how you light a building without using a fossil fuel. Looking at the historic structure and how it was designed to be a living building, to function in a way that would keep people comfortable without necessarily using a fossil fuel like whale, um, well, whale oil isn't a fossil fuel, but it is a fuel. Um, uh, without using coal, without using natural gas, without using today's generated electricity from those sorts of sources. So this is the Gibson House Museum. If you come in on the central floor, you'll see that there's this lovely chandelier, and then you look up the rod of the chandelier, and there's a light, as in a window that allows light to come through right here. This window opens up in order to allow air to circulate. If you go up here, you find this space right here on the second floor where the architect is looking down in order to um, see the distance through. So each of these windows can open up so that fresh air can come into these second floor windows. And then here's the skylight over all of the whole space that brings three floors of light into this building without requiring artificial light. So when people walk into your building and they say, oh, it's lovely, I love these high ceilings, it's your opportunity to talk about high ceilings, light, fresh air circulation, central stair halls, and how they were designed in order to make the house more comfortable. Here are some great examples of what we call borrowing light, uh, maybe even borrowing air, but borrowing light means when you move light from the outside wall, where it's coming in, all the way through to more sections. So that's what that was like up and down in the Gibson house, this is a cross building. So you have an interior window. So the light from this hallway actually gets into the linen closet here in the James J. Hill house. You don't need to flip a switch in order to find the sheets and towels in there. This closet has um, a window into the hallway, which allows light and fresh air to come in and into the bedroom. And this is an example of Blythe Hall Mansion and Garden, where an arboretum where this outdoor dining space, well, covered dining space allows um, light to come in through the window into that greenery area, but then it also comes into the kitchen where people are working and serving and providing the services for that space. So they're borrowing the light by letting it come through. So talking about the rest of the construction of how we use skylights, how we did shading in order to manage the light in those spaces is all an example of how people lived efficiently when they didn't have the easy resources that we had. It doesn't say it was all clean or all efficient, but it's an example of how they made choices that we could also make if that's appropriate in our space. But one of my favorite examples is also at the James J. Hill House. This is the laundry room on the left. And 
right here, we've now moved to this space of this room. This is where all the steam heat pipes run through this room it, that you wouldn't walk into. But you can drape the wet laundry over these racks and slide this into that room. And so as the steam heat is going through to heat the building, it's also drying those clothes. So a great way of adjacencies for efficiency. Being able to talk about that, not just as a cool way they did this stuff, it's why it worked efficiently and was appropriate and gives us stories for today. Every place has a climate story. And I took this photograph last night on my walk here in Tacoma that this is, uh, now it's a regular porch, but it was originally a sleeping porch. So when you didn't have air conditioning and it was hot, you might move to a sheltered area in order to sleep if you were one of the lucky ones who lived in a house like this. Porches, of course, are a great passive cooling approach. We have to bring them back wherever we can. We need to add them to new housing and to public housing, and we need to use them as a way to expand sociability that contributes to community cohesion if we're all out on porches or seeing each other when we take our walks at night and waving to each other and saying hello on our porches. So more about outside the house, model growing food. If you have open space and your historic site grew anything on site, I hope that you'll take the opportunity now to grow food on site because what you're doing is modeling ways and ways in which people can shorten the food miles, the number of miles that their food travels in order to get to them, which consumes fuel, requires packaging, requires cooling. Um, but we can model storing food in ways that gives people ideas and then um, give, even teach them how to do it. So this is at Point Defiance, at Fort Nisqually Living History Museum Point Defiance that I saw just recently. This is a green roof over the top of this root cellar. So you'd walk to the right and sort of go down a few steps and go in the root cellar for storing food. But as I'm standing there taking this photograph, a couple walks up and the woman says to the man, you know, this green stuff, green root stuff is coming back. This is how they're thinking about doing new architecture. I think it's cool. Well, I'm in the corner celebrating that she's made the connection all by herself. That's a big one for me. So here's another example of modeling fewer food miles. I just want to tell you, this is not an official program of the of Jefferson's Monticello. This is something a student of mine created when we were talking about how to make, how to use museum programming for behavior change. And cre she created a placemat that a family could use sort of like a game table for figuring out how they might choose all the things that Thomas Jefferson grew for people who lived in Thomas Jefferson's Monticello group for him. And choose which they might grow and what they would eat. And if you put them together in various combinations, you earn badges for eating like Thomas Jefferson. I think it's an awesome example. She got an A. A little bit more about super few, supporting fewer food miles. This is Biscaya Museum and Gardens where they brought back what they called the village of this particular site, the village that grew the food, um, housed the workers in order to supply the super big mansion. They brought back the agricultural aspect in order to have a weekly farmer's market and to create these community gatherings for um, community meals. And of course, we, always, we can always model composting if we're doing it on site, we can talk about it, we can do it historically, and we don't necessarily have to put the manure in the bottom of the um, historic greenhouse but it would work, it would compost it, and it would help keep the greenhouse warm. And lastly, I wanna give an example of Barnesworth um, where, so this is a National Trust site where this particular tree needed to be taken down. It's a danger to the site, no longer healthy, not going to last, but it's being replaced with progeny. So seedlings from that particular plant is being, um, are being cultivated in order to repopulate the space. So we have a role in thinking about biodiversity and the health of the land that we are occupying at the time at our historic house. But adapting to climate change is really a big thing and we all need to get better to do it. Disaster preparation no longer is good enough. All readiness, readiness to reduce reduce the impacts of that disaster, not just respond to it, is our first line of defense. 
That makes the response part easier. So I show you this picture to tell you how disasters are coming to us in unexpected ways. If you look at this photograph, it's a bit confusing. There's a boat, there's a sidewalk, there's a lot of water, and here's a car. Well, this is historic Annapolis. This is city dock. This boat is supposed to be there. It's the city dock. But the tide is high this day. And this um, storm sewer here has flooded backwards. So there's no storm valve to prevent this high tide from coming through the pipes up through the system and flooding all of this area. It's called sunny day flooding and it's happening all over our coasts. One of the things we need to do is improve our infrastructure in ways that this doesn't happen, which means putting valves on every single one of these storm sewer drains that goes out into waterways. There's a lot of work to be done, but it protects that whole historic area if they do that. So suiting up for these future conditions is critical. And um, Historic New England has benefited from a $165,000 grant from Save America's Treasures in order to help them do that. Now, you and I might look at that and think, really? This is just historic preservation. And you'd be right. It is historic preservation, which is also climate adaptation, preparation, and preparedness by taking care of our sites so that they last longer, they're stronger, and they're protected is one of the ways we address climate change. We reduce heat loss, we make the building last longer, we require a few resources to care for it, and we provide an example for our community, ways in which we can train them to do the same things for their properties. Because if we lose the properties each time there's a storm and then we rebuild them, then we're not adapting really very well. So here's an example, another example of future-proofing from the National Trust. So picture, this is the exterior for Lindhurst and look at the inside, and you wouldn't want to put heating and air conditioning ducts in there, would you? But it's getting hotter and more humid. Hard for the visitors, terrible for the art. How do we address this in an energy efficient and historically appropriate way? We're working on doing that by using the existing air circulation systems and then enhancing them slightly in order to improve conditions while not exacerbating our contributions to climate. And I say are not because I work for the National Trust, but because I was on part of the planning committee for green grants at the National Trust supporting that work. Here's another example for them. Oatlands um, Leesburg Plantation used to have a cupola up here on the top designed to draw cool air in through these big double hung windows, bring fresh air all the way up through the central stair and out of the building. So what they're doing is restoring, they're not putting the cupola back on but they are restoring the open vents that allow this air to come through. And so it could even come through these vents here and restore cool circulation coming through the building. They're not going for air conditioning, but they're going for a much more comfortable passive cooling approach, really critical in thinking about historic integrity, comfort of the visitor and impacts on climate. But this, is work, this work is not easy because of our historic sites that were not built for invasive air conditioning. So with permission from Vizcaya Museum um, and Gardens, I'm showing their recent work on how they've put much more efficient systems, that's the one on the right, um, into a very narrow ceiling space. They managed to fit it in um, and come up with a much more efficient approach when this inefficient air handling unit needed to be removed. And by the time they get done with the project, this is what it looks like. So this is the third floor in the staff offices. Staff will be able to work on the third floor in Miami without um, huge intervention in the historic site and much more efficient approach. So how are we going to get through this? Well, we're gonna get through it by being resourceful, like coming up with more efficient approaches, still re respecting the integrity of the building as much as we possibly can, and coming up with better solutions for our community. And Strawberry Bank Museum is a poster child for doing this work. High tides, king tides particularly, flood the historic spaces here. It's built on an old dock area off the waterway, and the dock area has been infilled. With all of that infills, there's lots of space for water to naturally creep in. Same for the 
half of the city of Boston and so many of our coastal communities were built on infill. So the water's coming in and up, it comes into the basement. They have one of the best videos, a uh, uh, YouTube video about water filling up the basement and then receding that you've ever seen with a little yellow rubber ducky that goes around in order to show you what the action is like. And when you see that happen at your historic site, when it, at night when you're at home and you come back, you see this video and this is what happened, it gives you a way to demonstrate this is a problem. We need help solving it. We need a team to do this work. And their partnership with the National Park Service and the city of Portsmouth is coming is doing the research to figure out how to protect these spaces and educate the community in doing the same. Because what happens at your site happens in your neighborhood. So whether it's a storm event, you know, as a big downpour, whether it's sea level rise coming up in a tide or through a storm event, whether it's extreme heat like so many of us are feeling right now or the wildfires that come with it, what's happening at your site is happening in your neighborhood. And the solutions you can come up with on your own or better with them will help all of you address those issues. So this is an example of um, a aqua fence that goes all the way around this historic structure if you wanted to deploy it in advance of a high tide or a storm event. The water coming here, the weight on it helps hold this in place so that it really it's not totally impermeable, much more um, much better for your site, prevents much more water infiltration than if you didn't have that or if you just had sandbags without significant additional effort. And so because Vizcaya is one of the presenters later on, I'm going to give you a little sneak preview without going too far into it. Uh, but Vizcaya on Biscayne Bay in Miami just takes hits over and over and over from the climate. So what are they doing? They're not abandoning the site because it's too valuable to the community, too valuable to Miami culture. So they've got to come up with a better solution. And here are just some of the things they're doing. This Remember when I said we don't do enough out on the landscape? These guys have figured it out. So they have a three-year pruning cycle for their landscape. The idea is that it makes their trees healthier. It reduces the amount of store damage. Stuff doesn't fall out of the trees when there's a storm, which means they don't have to clean off all of that stuff. And when it falls, it doesn't damage anything below it, including a lot of the sculpture. Now you might think you're looking at a bit of a mess right here, but this is after the 2017 hurricane. So all of those trees are still standing. Everything is still standing, just little branches are down. And the staff will tell you that when they drove from home through the streets of Miami to get to Vizcaya and they saw the amount of damage, they saw the road blockage, they were so anxious about what they were going to see and they were stunned that this is all that they were looking at in this particular section. This meant that they didn't need as much money, time, staff, or fossil fuels for cleanup. And any of that that they did, they could, have de they could deploy to other parts of the property. So sometimes resilience is just avoiding the worst of it. But this is what the worst of it looks like. So their basement air handling units being trashed post Maria, but they've worked on coming up with replacements that are more efficient, that are a little bit raised and are safer and wait for it. They have an awesome tiger dam. So this is the tiger dam. So remember we saw that other uh, aqua fence? This is a tiger dam. So it's fillable with water. These tubes are fillable with um, ocean water or regular water. Um, fill up in a matter of minutes. They can be anchored and stacked on top of each other to make it higher and higher, depend upon the event that you're expecting. And if you go to this Instagram link right here, which I'll try and remember to give you later, you can see that there's a video talking about um, testing this and installing it. And part of that video shows right here where the manufacturer is testing a flood release of all of this water and how well that the tiger dam held. So for Vizcaya, this is a perfect solution for resiliency in the face of climate change events. 
All right, so I have just a few more slides to tell you. I'm going to go away from particular historic sites and I'm going to go back out to the big picture. This has been a personal effort of mine ever since the president announced his President Trump announced his intention to step out of the Paris Agreement. It was important to me that cultural institutions who cared about environment and climate still do this work. And so the cultural sector was gathered together and joined America is all in. Oh, it, we are still in. That's what it was called when we were out of the Paris Agreement. On Earth Day of this year, President Biden, who had put us back in the Paris Agreement, set a goal for the United States to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And that goal was 50 to 52% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the year 2005. And 50 to 52% by 2030. How did he come up with that number? Where did he have the science and the data in order to tell him that he could confidently commit the country to this goal and set this global example? It's because many of us had been doing this work all along. But I can tell you that in four years, it was very hard to get people to understand that cultural institutions were a part of this. We contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and we can talk to the public about it in ways that they understand and feel connected to so that they might do similar work and call for it. So when the White House press release listed all of the types of organizations that were part of how to figure out how we're going to succeed, Cultural institutions was part of that. All of us can be part of this big change. And actually, we need all of us to, because it's too big a job to leave to somebody else. So if we go back to thinking about navigating community challenges, these four or more, the new ones that come, all of our institutions can choose um, do all of these or choose among all of those whether you're the director, the facilities manager, the ticket taker, the interpreter, the board member, the funder, you can support, encourage all of these and you can model all of these activities. History has solutions. We know how to use the media in order to share information and create sociability in our communities. We know how to create positive engagement. We know how to communicate thoughtfully. And we know where the science and the data and the evidence is in order to tell really great stories to bring more, more of us along in this fight. So your choice matters on what you do. I don't care whether it's big or small, but there's something that you can do. I hope that it grows to big and I hope that it grows to something that you do in concert with others. Because when we cooperate, we have far greater impacts. None of us knows enough alone and none of us has the agency and ability to do it alone, but all of us can get better at it if we're relentless and if we work together. So I'm thrilled that you're here today. I hope that you find something here that's helpful for you. And if you need anything else, you should definitely give me a call and ask. If I don't have an answer, which is extremely likely because I don't have experience in every single one of these places, I know somebody who does. We can make a connection so that you can make progress in the way that you'd like. So thank you for coming. And I hope we have lots of questions and chances to share. I know there are folks in the audience who've done good things. Um, and I'd like you to share them with everyone else because that's how we all work. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that inspiring talk and um, very useful action items too. It's always my, you know, my favorite talks are the ones that have really specific examples so we can all draw connections to our own sites and experiences. So we have time for Q&A now. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, if you prefer to ask your question by unmuting and you can just use the raise your hand button um, and I can call on you to unmute. Um, we have a couple questions that we can ask, um, but since we have a lot of time, I would love to see more questions from people. So feel free to put those in the chat. Our first question um, is, a bit about you know, the practicalities of doing this change. As you said, every site can do this. Well, what is the outlook for funding um, for various projects such as um, interpretation on climate change or efforts to adapt to climate change? What is the funding outlook for all that work? So I'd ask, the, I'd ask you to think about it 
differently. We don't fund green work, we fund smart work. We fund programs that happen to be green. We fund um, uh, capital improvements, rehabilitation, building ceiling and restoration that happen to have efficiency, climate, green sort of benefits. Consider it all capacity building, consider it doing your job well. And so rather than look for green funding, but I will talk about that in a moment, think about, um, think about it as being professional, being responsible, being thoughtful, that happens to have a green aspect to it. So green is another selling point of your really good idea. But I do think there's more and more green funding developing, but it looks different than what we're used to finding. Uh, the, Climate funders understand that to do this work, it has to be, to do this work to have enough impact needs to be collective and collaborative. So they tend to fund big projects that individual institutions contribute to. So we will probably have better luck as a sector when we go in for projects together, that we wanna learn energy modeling for historic houses, or we need more research in whether or not letting the temperature and relative humidity drift um, saves us energy and therefore what kind of monitoring and skill building do we need in order to adopt that so when we tackle it as a field we can bring down more green money when we're tackling it individually it's just good business and the folks who want to support good business at our sites can get behind the climate absolutely thank you uh jerry Faust, thanks for raising your hand go ahead and unmute Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Great uh, presentation. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback off of uh, what you were talking about with respect to funding. There's tons of funding out there for a variety of museum related uh, uh, projects, including emergency preparedness and uh, facilities repair and preservation, which all sort of feed into the uh, climate change preparation that uh, each historic house museum uh, should be going through. Uh, they are, um, you know, as you were saying, they're, they're all good business. Uh, in fact, one of the early things when I first uh, met uh, Sarah Sutton, one of the uh, first things that Dumbarton House was doing was a uh, sort of staff and energy audit uh, for the facility, uh, which helped us understand where we were basically spending money that we didn't need to be spending money. Uh, and it helped us change our practices on a daily uh, daily basis from, you know, what kind of paper we were using to print out. Did we need to print things out? What was, what were plugged into outlets that really needed to be plugged in? Do they need to be plugged in all the time or just as, and also as we replaced equipment in particular, uh, um, uh, surge protectors, uh, we went with and started going with, uh, smart, uh, surge protectors that allowed you to, shut a particular thing off and cut all power to uh, the various appliances that were connected to that. So it's little things like that as you go to start uh, replace uh, things such as light bulbs or surge protectors, you look for the next generation to, uh, uh, to plug into and uh, so to speak. And uh, um, that helped us a lot. So that was one of, that's sort of uh, the example that uh, I wanted to highlight there. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, so we have a couple of questions about how to move this work forward at our various sites. So um, one question that uh, comes from Chuck is, in some parts of the country, climate change is a highly controversial topic. How to approach the board of directors to manage, um, to raise funds and awareness in an environment that may be toxic? Do you have any advice on that, Sarah? That's a really important question, and we have some good uh, research on the best approaches. So this is a climate communication issue rather than a museum or board of directors or even a political issue. It feels political because personal identity is more closely tied to conservation choices than the knowledge we have in our brains, which is why for the last 40 years, teaching people about the environment has not changed behavior significantly. We are not solely logical people. We are very emotional creatures interested in survival. And so our identity and how we respond to things guides a lot of what we do. 
And if politics is dangerous or identity is threatened by climate discussions, it's a no-go. Don't even try a climate conversation. But you can try a conversation that's about saving energy, which reduces costs, which we have to displace those costs onto program operations or just making it survivable during an economic downturn. So what are the values of the board of directors, sustainability of the institution, the bottom line, public engagement, when we can determine what we share as the value, that's the place to start working. So even if you have to do stealth green, you can't use the word climate change. There are things that you know that affect climate and environment that are benefits, co-benefits of this work. You don't have to label it if labeling it drives, causes trouble. Uh, there's, there's no shame in getting the work done just using someone else's language because sometimes it's the only way to move forward. And you know what? When they engage in it and they find out that it works, you start to lose the stress about those other issues and they'll become advocates for the values that they see in it, which helps other people feel more comfortable with it. It's hard work, Chuck. It's really hard work. Um, and and you just got to do it. Where Whatever way works, pursue it. That's great advice. Thank you, Sarah. On a similar note, uh, what can the regular staff do about climate change when they might not have the encouragement or permission of their managers or leaders? Well, where you can find out how to put it in the discussion, if you're the interpreter, to bring it in as a fact of the site, uh, is a great way to start. Normalizing the conversation about environment and climate is our first line of defense. Uh, so being able to have a conversation that's related to environment and climate is your first step. So if you're an interpreter, you talk about it and you demonstrate it. I mean, what better way to take a group through a, a tour of an historic house than as you bring them into a totally darkened room if you're able to operate shades and windows to open it up so that they can see it, they get a lesson in operable windows and operable shades and think about passive heating management that may just darn well transfer to home. I mean, so I'm in Washington state, it's going to be 95 degrees. I lived in Hawaii, I'm totally used to 95 degrees. The people here are panicking. They've completely forgotten how to do the passive approaches of pull down the shades, pull in the nighttime air and cool the house. And so reestablishing those basic practices are important. That's something you can do. If you're in charge of purchases, you can find the green items that get purchased. If you're in charge of special events, you can um, specify a local vendor so with local food. So there are ways that you might do it at home that you can sort of slip into the work that you do as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. Those are all the questions that I see coming in the chat. If anyone else has any thoughts they wanna share, please go ahead and do that now uh, or raise your hand to unmute as well. Um, if anyone has any examples of actions they're doing at your sites, uh, go ahead and unmute and share that as well. It's great to hear from other people. Um, and in the meantime, as we're waiting, if anyone wants to work up the courage to do that, I just will remind you to uh, sign up for the other five sessions of this series. Uh, they all touch on different aspects of the three crises that um, I mentioned, and they all present a lot of different case studies. So it will be really interesting, no matter what your background is, to, to see these different sessions. They're all free, and they happen every two weeks on Thursday. Um, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And I'll send that link in the chat again in case uh, you've lost it uh, to register. And yes, this recording will be available later. Uh, thanks to this grant um, and the willingness of our speakers, the recordings will be available in perpetuity on our YouTube page. So it will be a really great resource for anyone who wants to return to this topic. Uh, so I'll put those links in the chat now. And um, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to have to do a carbon offset if you're going to leave this on <laughs> in perpetuity on YouTube on a server someplace. <laughs> That's right. A whole other thing to think about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Don, um, 
I, I want to speak directly to you and wonder if you would mind unmuting and say that you tell us a little bit about your near or maybe zero waste um, effort at the Wagner Free Institute. Don's an example of somebody who started early, really persisted, and has come up with some awesome examples. Um, Sarah, it's so nice to see you again. I am so sorry I kind of came to this late, um, but um, I look forward to the recording of this. Um, Philadelphia, where the Wagner Free Institute of Science where I work, um, started a you know, recycling program kind of slowly, you know, it was only certain items um, and then it kind of grew over time. But um, our board decided that we wanted to um, embrace uh, sustainability as an institution in our mission. And um, so I started a recycling program. Um, and, you know, coincident with the citywide program. And it kind of grew from there. Uh, there are things that the city recycling program does not accept. But I found alternative places uh, to steer our, our waste stream. Uh, we, uh, we exist in North Philadelphia, which is right near Temple University. It's kind of a rough neighborhood. Um, and I find all kinds of things in our yard, gifts from the neighborhood, like old bike frames, all kinds of things. So I found this um, organization in West Philadelphia called Neighborhood Bike Works. They refurbish old bikes and they give them to kids and teach them how to ride safely and how to maintain their bikes. And so the bike frames that would appear in my yard would go to this uh, great little organization in West Philadelphia. And um, I could take that off of our contribution to the waste stream. It was recycled or repurposed. And that's basically what I've been doing with a whole host of other things. So the city of Philadelphia has a zero waste uh, program from its streets department. And we've achieved silver status, which I'm pretty proud of. And um, thank you, Sarah. It was, <laughs> it's great to see you and hear you again. Thank you. Well, thank you, Don. That's an example of being um, creative, curious, and courageous, which is what I believe is required to do this work. We have to come up with new ways to solve the problems. And the fact that we get these astonishing, unexpected benefits is a function of the fact that we are part of a system, a cultural system, a social system, an environmental system, a planetary system. Um, and that we've forgotten to look outside of our yards in that way, or we haven't had the opportunity to look outside the yards in that way until the system gets a little disrupted and we want to restart it, rebalance it. We want to create harmony in the system. And so Don's story is just a, a really fantastic example of how that happened, even though he didn't know that that was going to be the path that he took. Thanks, Don. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you to everyone who joined uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, I hope that you all enjoyed the session and are going to join us for all of the future ones. Uh, so thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.